our distinguished guest speaker tonight, Dr. Shoshana Wheatle, Tanisha Mary, our commentator for the evening, colleagues, students, former students, friends, everyone, good evening. It's my distinct pleasure this evening to welcome you all to Mona Law. Those of you who are visiting us for the first time, those of you who are returning, welcome home. <laughs> I see some of our former students. And indeed, Sashana is also, in a way, back home. She is, well, she will be introduced more in more detail by Tracy later on, but I'm proud to say that she is a graduate of the UWI, one of my former students, when we were in rather more humble surroundings. <laughs> right, Suzanne? Somewhere tucked away in, in, in education, and now you're back to bask in our fancy building, right? <laughs> and in honor of your attendance tonight, I think the weather has also shown us it's more conducive to British weather. <laughs> anyway, we are here this evening to celebrate with Sashona the launch of her book entitled Principled Reasoning in Human Rights Adjudication. And this book represents um, you know, the, the end product of her PhD research and, and thesis. It's, it's developed from her PhD thesis. And so I know for her it, it, it is like her first child, perhaps. <laughs> so we, we want to share and congratulate her in this remarkable achievement. Apart from the launch of the book, though, there will be a uh, more detailed discussion um, entitled Finding the Constitution, Constitutional Principles and Human Rights. That's the, the, the theme for this evening. So it will be in part the launch of the book and more generally a discussion on issues arising from the book. So I know you're all in for an intellectual feast this evening and so I will not prolong my welcome but just ask you to sit back and enjoy the discussions. And thanks again for coming to our lecture this evening. Oh, I'll now invite Ms. Tracy Robinson, a Deputy Dean for Graduate Studies and Research, to introduce our speaker. Tracy. Good evening, friends and colleagues, and students and former students. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Sashona Wheatle. As the Dean has already mentioned, she's a graduate of the Faculty of Law, the UWI. And we have no formal rank in, in the UA, but my guess is that she was, and some of her classmates are close by, um, she was the best in her class or very close to it. Uh, and I think those of us who taught her can endorse that. Uh, she left UE, um, did law school, did a Bachelor of Civil Law in Oxford on the Rhodes Scholarship, as well as the MPhil, and then went on to the DPhil. And as the Dean mentioned, the theme of her book is also the basis of the DPhil um, and the book sh which we're launching today. Uh, she was deeply interested and has been consistently in the impact of implied constitutional principles on human rights adjudication in common law jurisdictions. That was the title of her PhD. I view the book as one of the few serious and comprehensive attempts in the now burgeoning literature on comparative constitutional law to actually consider the Anglophone Caribbean. In fact, I can't think of any other piece of work, Sashana, of this magnitude uh, that takes seriously within the common law world the Anglophone Caribbean. It's not surprising um, that the focus of her work is implied principle. She comes from the jurisdiction that with the leadership of lawyers the constitutionality of the Gun Court Act in the uh, 70s and gave the entire common law world Heinz and the Queen, um, a case um, no self-respecting lawyer out of these parts is allowed to not know well.
um, no doubt her interest in the separation of powers and the rule of law has had a firm anchor in Caribbean constitutional law. And long before it became fashionable to talk about common law constitutionalism, in fact, persons like Margaret de Maria um, of the University and the West Indies had been perplexed for decades about how Caribbean judges were so obsessed with the common law in the development of constitutional principles. Both uh, of the themes of Sashona's work are incredibly important to the development of constitutional law in the Caribbean. Uh, beyond these important themes, implied constitutional rights, the role of the common law, both of which are related. Professor Wheatle, along with Arif Bulkan, are amongst the few scholars in Caribbean constitutional law to interrogate the rights to equality and non-discrimination, on which there is very little literature apart from her work and Bulkan's. Uh, in her case, uh, she's been looking closely at the new norms relating to equality and non-discrimination in the 2011 Charter in Jamaica, but has also contributed significantly to our understanding of the new Charter as one of the most important constitutional reforms of the last decade. Uh, in thinking about today's event, I thought about Sishona a decade ago when I first met her. Um, and I, I, I don't know, Dr. Matt Bean, if you also interviewed um, Dr. Wheatle for the roads. Um, I didn't, um, but I remember in the preparation and the thinking about that, uh, what I thought about Sashona. Sashona is in a remarkable category of someone I actually didn't teach, but nevertheless uh, came to know very well as a student. And my sense of her then, a decade later, remains true and well justified which is that she's the best I could recommend. She has emerged at a, as a very important, young comparative constitutional law scholar. Multiple reviews of her book describe it as a valuable resource, a welcome addition uh, to the field of comparative constitutional law. She's a co-editor of a soon to be released Oxford handbook on Caribbean constitutions. Uh, yesterday I went back and I looked at some of the initial assessments I had of Sashona when she was a student at Mona, um, because although we were both at Caville, I actually didn't teach her then. And I'm going to ask you to indulge me as um, I tell you some of what I thought of her then. So then I said Sashona was a student in that constitutional law class, which I came to Mona for eight hours for from Caville who was absolutely remarkable. The tendency in constitutional law is for the best students to have first degrees, not becoming from A-levels or CAPE, but I had never met an undergraduate constitutional law student with the command that she had. She came with very fine A-level results from Campion. She was a top student there, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything in the Faculty of Law. <laughs> And it certainly doesn't tell you how you're going to do in constitutional law. And I'm going to quote, I cannot say for certain now when she made her first intervention in those eight hours of review I did at Mona. But it was within the first 20 minutes or so of the session. She reluctantly and somewhat dividendly responded to some early questions I asked. And in that moment, in as much as you can produce a perfect answer, she provided one. Every single time, the pitch, the detail, the points of emphasis, the quality of comprehension and analysis were breathtaking. None of my students at Cavill that year came anywhere close to her level. And it was apparent that she was way ahead of her peers at Mona. I surmised that this accounted for her dividends, which I was only marginally sympathetic to. Frankly, I became impatient with it. I urged her to give it up and take the risk of exposing the fullness of her preparation and analysis. A little more confidently, and still in the first hour of the eight hours, she laid out the scheme of savings law clauses and provided a critique of it with devastating competence. 
As all of you know, this is one of the most technical and notoriously difficult areas of constitutional law. That precise and flawless presentation could have embarrassed many a seasoned legal practitioner. In fact, I was silenced. Her classmates, who had clearly throughout the year developed considerable respect for her and knew that her cautiousness in no way masked her extraordinary ability, broke the silence. The class jester jumped in. Miss, she didn't just take up the point, as I had been urging. Miss, she mash it up. She massacre it. The class burst into a round of laughter, of appreciation for her skill and her knowledge. Over the course of eight hours, Sashona repeated this performance of quiet, irreproachable interventions countless times. As a teacher, I found her involvement invigorating and I admit awesome. And my subsequent conversations with colleagues confirmed I was not alone in this thinking. I didn't need an entire semester to form the view by the end of that eight hours that she had to be the best student anywhere close to her in the LLB program. Sashona, we're proud of you. We're proud of the accomplishment of this fine book. We're privileged to welcome you back, even briefly, to the UA and to Mona. We hope you will return to us, and even for longer. And we very much look forward to your reflections and your return to some of the thoughts in your important new book. Sashona. Uh, thanks so much, Tracy. That was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I was telling Tracy before that I was nervous to come and talk about something that I've written because that's one of the fears that I have, and I think that most academics have, which is strange because that's what we spend our lives doing. It's writing and then talking about what we write, but it is still how many years later since I've started my academic journey, it's still terrifying. But anyway, I thought that's what would terrify me about speaking today. And now after listening to Tracy, <laughs> she set the bar way, way too high. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really a privilege to be here speaking to and speaking with people who have influenced my career so much. And I'm nervous I'll disappoint you. I'm nervous I'll let you down. But Thank you so much for everything you've done for, for me. And Tracy, thank you for, for the um, conversations we've had over the years, at those points where I felt like I didn't want to do this anymore, <laughs> that I should quit, <laughs> that I should give up. And thank, thanks to everyone, and thanks to Suzanne as, as well, um, who I've had many debates with <laughs> over the years because we agree on almost nothing. <laughs> we agree on almost nothing, but it was Suzanne who really sparked my, my interest, my fascination, my, my, my love affair, in a sense, uh, with the law. So thank you for having me here to speak about the book. Uh, as um, Dr. Lee said, the book is based on my PhD thesis. Um, and the title of the PhD thesis, I can't remember. Um, I do know, though, that when I was submitting the book proposal, sent it to my supervisor and asked, you know, what do you think about the proposal? And he said, change the title, it sounds like a PhD thesis. So I came up with uh, this title for the book, Principled Reasoning in Human Rights Adjudication, which sounded like a good idea at the time. And now every time I look at it, I cringe and I think this is a terrible title. <laughs> so that's the title of the book. The title of the lecture is Finding the Constitution, Constitutional Principles and Human Rights. And there's a colon there because academics love colons. We can't just have three, less, <laughs> three words doing the job for us. We have to put explain and explain um, everything um, within the title itself. But for the lecture today, I'll be speaking about the persistence of unwritten constitutional principles and commenting briefly on some of the implications of the use of unwritten constitutional principles. And I'll start by talking about <laughs> written constitutionalism and explaining why I think it's so interesting, so fascinating, and so important for us to consider and dissect the work that unwritten constitutional principles still continue to do despite the presence of written constitutions. So the independence movement, particularly from the 1960s onwards, contributed to the rise of the written constitution. 
So written constitutions are now seen as almost expected for any constitutional democracy. And the dominance of written constitutions has seen continued resonance. So in response to upheavals in South Africa, in Afghanistan, the response or part of the response has been to try to uh, enact a written constitution. And even in the UK, with the constitutional havoc that's being wreaked by Brexit, and I'm sure that's probably not the, that's not the chief concern of Brexit. There are very, very, very many concerns <laughs> about the havoc that Brexit will, will uh, result in in the UK. But one of the interesting discussions emerging out of that is about whether there should be a written or codified constitution for the UK. Spoiler alert, the answer is no. The, the answer will always be no. <laughs> I think the answer will always be no. But the point is, written constitutions have been on the rise for decades, and there's, there's no sign that that will, will stop, with the possible exception of the UK, which believes that everything it's doing has always been right, <laughs> always been just, and there's no need to put things on in principles like the, the lowly former colonies have to. Is this actually being live-streamed, by, <laughs> by the way? <laughs> I, have to, I have to be cautious, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> That point wasn't supposed to go on for so long, but it's, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine, especially when talking to my UK colleagues about why it is not necessary to have a written constitution, it's completely anti-democratic, but yet the former colonies had to do it. But anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that despite the fervor for written constitutionalism, for textual constitutionalism, there remains a per persistent influence, <laughs> persistent influence of unwritten or implied constitutional principles. And that's what the book focuses on. So I examine the phenomenon of the use of implied constitutional principles in judicial decision making in fundamental rights cases, specifically. And the research is comparative. It's a comparative piece of work because I compare and discuss and analyze uh, cases from Australia, Canada, the Commonwealth Caribbean, and the UK. And the purpose of the book was really to examine the different functions that these principles play when they're used in human rights decision making with a focus on separation of powers and rule of law. So what I tried to do was to isolate and analyze the different ways in which courts use these principles instead of just focusing on what most academics have been doing, which is should they be using these principles. And I argued that these principles play three functions in human rights adjudication. Firstly, they're used as interpretative aids, so just as tools that can help judges figure out what the text or what the words in the Constitution actually mean. Secondly, they're used as grounds or independent grounds or bases for striking down legislation. And finally, they're used as gateways to foreign law or to comparative law. And one of the implications I discuss or want to discuss today, of course, relying on unwritten principles in these ways, is that it leaves us to question what exactly is the Constitution, how is it defined, and who should legitimately pronounce on the definition of the Constitution. So I think this topic actually exposes a lot of the deep-seated and foundational issues in constitutional study itself. And in my view, if you look at these three functions, it's mainly the second and the third functions that present more of a difficulty or, or present more of a challenge for constitutional law or for the question of finding the constitution and determining who should legitimately pronounce on the meaning of the constitution. So what I'll do is that I'll first outline the use of principles as grounds for invalidating legislation and as avenues for using foreign law, and then I'll move on to talking about the implications of these practices. So I'll start with implied principles as grounds for invalidating legislation. And Tracy is quite right that my interest in this was sparked by the Heinz case and by being at Oxford and going through the, 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 the research process and seeing that no one else around me seemed to care or think that it was important for, for us to study this. And I kept saying, but in the Caribbean, this happened, like, this seriously happened, and it's amazing, and it's weird, and no one's talking about it. Why is no one talking about it? And 
it so happens that if you dig deep enough, you'll see it happening in, in some other jurisdictions, and I thought it was worth studying. So, right, implied principles as grounds for invalidating legislation. Now, what happens here is that the court's decision is not based on the text of the Constitution itself, but it's based on a principle that is not expressed in the substantive provisions of the Constitution or of the Bill of Rights. And I found three circumstances in which courts will use implied principles in this way. The first circumstance is where there's a gap in the Bill of Rights with respect to a particular fundamental right or interest. So that means that there's a case before the court that seems to give rights or seems to engage a particular right, but for some reason, the Bill of Rights does not expressly guarantee this right. The second situation occurs where there's a gap in the power that the constitutional text confers on the court to invalidate legislation. So that's a judicial power gap. And finally, this is a situation where there's ordinary legislation, so legislation outside of the constitutional text that tries to remove or oust or exclude the power of the court to conduct judicial review. And this third category is more relevant to the UK. So I won't speak about this today, um, although we can discuss it afterwards in, in uh, comments and discussions if anyone wants to. So I'll speak briefly about the first two circumstances. So a constitutional rights gap. Now this particular instance has played a role in the Caribbean, but it's also played a role in, in Australia. And the one case I'll mention uh, briefly today is South Australia and Tatani. Now in Australia, the Constitution does not include a Bill of Rights, unlike our constitutions here in the Caribbean. So that means that the courts in Australia have had to find very creative ways of striking down statutes that infringe fundamental rights. And of course you're all thinking, well if the Constitution doesn't include a Bill of Rights, that means that the courts aren't supposed to be striking down legislation for violations of, of Bills of Rights. But, as my supervisor used this unfortunate metaphor of um, there, there more, there's more than one way to skin a cat, which I, I never liked because I have cats myself, <laughs> but that's essentially, yeah, that was my reaction to <laughs> the first time he said it, but it stuck with me. <laughs> but this is essentially what's happened in Australia. <laughs> They've discovered that using implied principles means that they don't have to worry too much about the fact that the text of the Constitution does not include a Bill, a bill of Rights. So in South Australia and Tatani, the High Court struck down a statutory provision on the ground that it undermined the institutional independence of the court and the separation of powers. And the statute that was initiated there was the Serious and Organized Crime Act of South Australia. And under the act, this is the facts are a bit complicated, but essentially under the statute, the Attorney General had the power to add certain groups to lists of declared organizations. And once a group became a declared organization as decreed by the Attorney General, then the police could target that group, disrupt their activities, target their members. So th similar statutes have been enacted as, as kind of a counter-terrorism measure in lots of jurisdictions. So the Attorney General has the power to declare um, an organization under the statute. Now in Section 14 of the Act, the Commissioner of Police can make an application to the court that a particular person is a member of a declared organization. And upon that application by the Commissioner of Police, the court has to make a control order against this particular defendant. And the control order is serious because if this person breaches the control order, then they've committed a criminal offense and they can be sentenced to prison for up to five years. The problem with this statute then, that particular provision, was that it was the Attorney General, because it was the Attorney General who determined what groups became declared organizations, the court was essentially being ordered to rubber stamp decisions of the Attorney General without doing its own independent assessment of whether this organization should be a declared organization or not. And you might be wondering, well, they still have to determine whether the person is a member. It was very, very easy to show that someone was a member because you could just be, you sent a text <laughs> to a particular person or exchange emails, etc. So the concern was that the court was not able to exercise its own judgment on a particular issue. So the majority of the High Court of Australia found that the section was invalid because it sought to enlist the court in using the judicial process to act at the behest of the Attorney General. So their thinking was that the court was essentially surrendering its powers to the executive. 
Now, how do they get around the fact that there's nothing in the Constitution that speaks to this or says that the court can strike down legislation on this, on this ground? The court took the position that the rule of law is an unwritten assumption of the Constitution and that the rule of law is undermined by legislation that deprives the courts of their independence and impartiality. So essentially the point is, you figure out that there are unwritten assumptions of the Constitution, the rule of law is one of them, and then the rule of law means that there should be independence and impartiality of, of the courts, and so this legislation um, is invalid. So that's an example of the constitutional rights gap uh, circumstance in, in action. The judicial power gap is I think perhaps a bit more interesting um, because of the cases it has, it has led to, especially in the Caribbean. And this is where, for instance, the Constitution might confer the power on the courts to strike down legislation, but it does not extend that power to, to the right in question or to the particular legislation in question. And so we have their gap in judicial power. The court can see that something is going wrong in a sense but the Constitution does not express to tell them that they can do anything about this. And one example of this, of this sort of gap in judicial power occurs in the Caribbean because of the, the, uh, the savings law pauses that, that Tracy mentioned. We just can't get away from these pauses, it seems. So I'll briefly talk about savings law pauses, very, very, very briefly because there's so much that can be said. So we know that in the Jamaican Constitution, for instance, it provides that if any law is inconsistent with the Constitution, the Constitution shall prevail and the other law shall be void to the extent of any inconsistency that arises. And the Constitution also confers on the courts jurisdiction to provide relief for breaches of the rights that are set out in Chapter 3 of the Constitution. So Chapter 3 is our fundamental rights chapter and the Constitution confers power on the courts to provide relief for breaches of those rights. But these seemingly broad grants of power sit alongside the Savings Law Clause, which limits the power of the courts to enforce rights provisions in Chapter 3. The Savings Law Clause does this by saying that any legislation passed or enforced before the Constitution cannot be held to have been inconsistent with the provisions of Chapter 3 of the Constitution. trying to decide whether to talk about the amendments under the 2011 Charter of Rights. So the Savings Law Clause was amended in 2011 by the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. So it looks a bit different now. Uh, but before the amendment, nine years before this constitutional amendment, one of the most fascinating cases I've ever read in constitutional law um, arose in DPP and Mollison. And in this case, the Privy Council used the implied principle technique to get around or to evade the original savings law clauses restrictions on the power of the court. The Mollison story was that he had been convicted of a murder which was committed when he was 16 years old. So he was convicted and then he was sentenced to detention under the Governor General's pleasure, which was what was prescribed by the Juveniles Act of 1951. He appealed against this sentence and one of his arguments was that the sentence infringes right under Section 15 of the Constitution, that's part of Chapter 3, it infringes right not to be deprived of liberty except under, in accordance with the sentence of the court because it's the Governor General or the Executive that's determining his sentence. But he also argued that his sentence infringes separation of powers because the length of the sentence was to be determined by a member of the Executive rather than a member of the Judiciary. Now, because the Juveniles Act was passed in 1951, which was before the Constitution, the courts had this difficulty where they could not find, they could not hold that the Act was inconsistent with the right to liberty under Section 15 of the Constitution. So what they did was that they said, hold on, I was about to say hold up, but <laughs> hold on. This legislation infringes separation of powers, which is a fundamental principle of our Constitution. And so what happened in Mollison is that essentially we have the court, at the urging of, uh, of lawyers, of course, developing a very clever technique for circumventing a textual gap in the court's power to invalidate legislation, which throws up all these issues about, well, what is it that the framers of the Constitution actually intended? Isn't the point that, they should, that any law that existed before the Constitution should have been saved? Isn't that what was meant and not necessarily 
well, you can't strike it down based on the provisions, but you can't strike it down based on principles. But of course, words matter, and <laughs> most of us here are lawyers, so this is how it works. The Constitution only spoke to provisions of Chapter 3 and not about principles, so the Privy Council was able to develop this clever technique. And I think you see some echoes of this in the decisions of the Caribbean Court of Justice. The first sign of this being in the Attorney General for Barbados and Joseph and Boyce, and I have to say that Trace's um, writings on this case have actually been quite helpful in kind of teasing out what the, decisions of this, what the decision of the CCG actually meant. I'll speak about Joseph and Boyce very briefly, though it's discussed more extensively in the book. So in Joseph and Boyce, again, it's two men who had been convicted of murder, kind of a theme developing here, and in this case, they had been sentenced to death. And the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice, had to consider whether there was a breach of their rights to protection of the law. They argued that their rights to protection of the law had been, would be breached, rather, if they were executed before they could complete petitions before international human rights bodies. So their argument was that we've made these petitions to outside um, human rights bodies, you can't then go ahead and kill us before they've even had, had a chance to pronounce a judgment and say whether this is a violation of our international human rights. The issue was that the Constitution did not express a grant judicial authority to pro provide relief for this broad breach of protection of the law which was being claimed by Joseph and Boyce. However, using rule of law reasoning, the CCJ said that even if the Constitution does not expressly confer this power, the court possesses an inherent jurisdiction to provide relief for breaches of the right to protection of the law. And I think this idea that the court has inherent jurisdiction to provide relief for breaches of the law, possibly based on rule of law ideas, has been reinforced by recent judgments of the CCJ um, earlier this year in Nervais and the Queen, and this is also a judgment from Barbados. So that's the lay of the land in relation to implied principles as guns for invalidating legislation. So on to implied principles as gateways to foreign law, and I'll, I'll be quicker with this one, I promise. Um, implied constitutional principles are often used in a manner that actually expressly connects the court's reasoning to foreign jurisdictions, foreign traditions, and foreign laws. And this is not something I realized when I started on this work, but if you go through the judgments, you see this attempt by the courts to make it appear, or to explain rather, I don't want to seem too skeptical, but to explain that the rule of law, the separation of powers, or judicial independence, and this issue that's before the court, this is not a local issue. This is something that's global, it's universal, this is something that's observed by other jurisdictions with whom we share similar traditions. That's the sort of thinking or explanation that happens. So for instance, in the Heinz case that we've mentioned before, the Privy Council described the separation of powers principle as part of the Westminster parliamentary model, the Westminster constitutional model, which was adopted by Caribbean jurisdictions upon independence. The Privy Council in a, a case called Thomas and Baptiste described the rule of law as, as involving universally accepted standards of justice. Again, so this is not just about what's provided for in this particular jurisdiction. It isn't local, this is global. And this vision of the rule of law, I think, was reiterated in, again, the CCJ's judgment in Nervais and the Queen earlier this year. So there's a thread developing here. If we look to Canada, the Canadian Supreme Court has repeatedly described the rule of law as part of the British traditions adopted by Canada in its own independent constitutional settlement. Right, so with this overview, then, of the functions played by implied constitutional principles. We can now discuss the challenges that they pose. And I think the first step here is that the technique of using unwritten principles challenges what I would consider superficial ideas of what the Constitution is. And I think the underpinning idea to bear in mind here is that the written Constitution is not enacted in a vacuum. It's not enacted in isolation. It's enacted against a background of these very constitutional principles. So um, a Canadian academic, Mark Walters, he has suggested that there are two ways of thinking about or conceptualizing the relationship between written and unwritten constitutional norms. The first 
the first is to think about it as there being a formal distinction between the written constitution and an unwritten constitution. So that kind of, they, they're separate and they shall never meet. They have nothing to do with each other, at least they shouldn't. That's the first way of looking at it. The second view, however, is that the written constitution is really an expression of the unwritten norms of the constitution. So what's there in the text is basically meant to tease out these underlying principles like rule of law and separation of powers. And if we adopt the second view, this means that, in, in Walter's words, he uses this, this pretty cool metaphor that it means that the written, con written constitution can no more break loose from the unwritten constitution than an island can separate from the seabed that lies beneath the waters that surround it. And that's like, Suzanne, your face is just like, what is that? <laughs> But I think the island, the islander in me kind of, I, I like that metaphor of, of the, the written constitution being built on, um, uh, on the seabed of unwritten constitutionalism. And beyond the metaphor, I just find this analysis or this second point of view very convincing because it highlights what I think is a, is a symbiosis really between written and unwritten constitutional norms. I try to use a picture, you see? So the, the idea is that the written and unwritten norms are intertwined um, in some respect. And I think this idea goes some distance towards establishing that when courts use implied constitutional principles, they're really giving effect to implicit norms that are intimately connected to the written constitution itself. So if we look at it this way, relying on unwritten constitutional principles is not a venture outside of the bounds of the constitution. It is reliance on the Constitution itself because the Constitution is more complex, like the Canadian Supreme Court put it. It's more complex than just the written rules in the constitutional text. So that's all well and good, fine. The Constitution is broader, it includes unwritten norms, but that doesn't answer what I think is probably the more vexing question for lots of constitutional lawyers, which is even if implied principles can be properly seen as part of the Constitution, does that mean that courts should have the power to find and apply these principles? And one feature of this debate is that we have to think about the, the power of the judiciary and the role of the judiciary and compare that with the role of parliament in our society. And that leads us to thinking about uh, parliamentary supremacy, this idea that because of democracy, parliament is supreme. Parliament is a body that speaks for the people and that that should be respected. And that because of the, the underpinning role of democracy, parliament has more legitimacy in some respect than judges. Now, this argument is stronger in a jurisdiction like the UK, which, like I said, has no written constitution, hasn't conferred power on the, the, the courts to strike down legislation. But at the other end of the spectrum is the Commonwealth Caribbean, where our constitutions actually expressly establish themselves as supreme law. So that means that parliament really isn't supreme, at least in our jurisdictions, not in the way that parliament is supreme in the UK. Which means then that complaints about judicial power are more pressing in the UK. They're more pressing in Australia because even though there's a written constitution, there's no Bill of Rights. But we have the written constitution. We have the supremacy clauses in our constitution and we have courts having the power to strike down legislation. So this concern is less pressing in the Caribbean. But I think even here, we still have to be mindful about the kind of power that reasoning by implied principles can confer on the courts, in two respects especially. The first is that judges are still in charge of determining which principles ought to be implied into the Constitution. Right? So yes, we can use implied principles, but who determines which principles are the unstated assumptions of the Constitution or implicit in the text of the Constitution? Why is it that judges tend to refer to the rule of law and separation of powers? What about other principles? What about dignity or equality? They tend to be less willing to go for principles like that. You can argue that they look at things like separation of powers and rule of law because they are more, again, traditionally, um, the British or liberal, liberal constitutionalist idea of what constitutional principles are instead of focusing on people and what makes a difference in their lives, like things like equality or dignity and I'm straying into my other, my other area of interest. But the point is, it is judges who are in charge of finding these principles. Secondly, the power to reconcile these unwritten principles with the written or the expressed terms of the Constitution, that power also lies with the judiciary. 
So they get to decide which principles apply, and they get to decide whether those principles can override the text of the Constitution or whether they can be reconciled with the text of the Constitution in some way. So is this what is envisioned by our constitutional settlement? And we have to remember that the Constitution declares constitutional supremacy, not judicial supremacy. If we allow judges to have this kind of power, there might be a danger that we allow judges to essentially rewrite the Constitution by implication. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying this is so. I'm saying that we have to consider <laughs> whether this is, this is the road that we're going down. If we look at Australia, if we, do, we move from the Caribbean a bit and look at Australia, the implications are even starker because implied principles are there being used to supply these substantive limits against the legislature, despite that they have no Bill of Rights in that jurisdiction. So commentators on Australian constitutional law have argued that the Australian High Court has essentially implied a whole Bill of Rights into the Constitution by relying on these unstated assumptions or unstated principles of rule of law and separation of powers. A further potential impact in terms of judicial power is that implied constitutional principles can be used or might be used regardless of contradictory written provisions in the Constitution. Now, we don't know what effect this can necessarily have. It could be a conservative effect or an activist effect. So it could be conservative in the sense that the court can rely on an unwritten principle as a means of restraining its own power. That sometimes happens. So that's happened in Canada, for instance. The court will say that, well, the rule of law means that we shouldn't act in this particular instance. So there, there, that's possible, that there can be conservative effects. But activist effects are also possible where the court uses the principle to strike down legislation. I think the Mollison case is a good example of that. And the point is that I think we have yet to see the full implications of this type of reasoning, the full implications of what happens when the court relies on an unwritten principle to, to skirt the terms of the Constitution. Now, of course, the results might be desirable. I generally agree with the results in most of these cases, even when I question, to some extent, the, the, the um, the kind of institutional power balance that's, that arises there. And I'm generally, of course, I'm, f I'm fervently against savings law clauses. But we have to grapple with the consideration that the results might be desirable in this case, but what we're establishing is not necessarily a result. It's a method of doing something, and it's a method that we have to question because the method can lead to results that we don't agree with in the future. And this is the difficulty of constitutional um, uh, techniques. So, the last point I'll make about judicial power is the most controversial pattern that I see in the use of implied principles. And this is that, <clears throat> this is when the principles are used to enhance the power of the court. Now in chapter six of the book, I go into a lot of detail talking about the fact that where implied principles are used to strike down legislation, so where they're used as the ground of invalidating a statute. The way the principle is applied is almost exclusively in a way that defends the court's power or the court's jurisdiction. And this generates a, a, a potential conflict of interest um, concern. And to some, to some academics, it seems to threaten the very legitimacy of the court because what it seems to suggest is that the courts will, will reach as far as they can in order to protect themselves. And this is even more striking when some of these decisions concern judges' salaries, which they sometimes do. I kind of feel bad even saying that. I'm used to defending <laughs> judicial action, but I'm explaining what we're up against because this is the problem. People look at these decisions and say, what is happening here? They're just calling on these unwritten principles basically to say that they should have more power or that they should have more money. <laughs> so um, there's a Canadian academic who argues that um, Decisions in which legislation was struck down on the basis of the unwritten principle of judicial independence, they've all had to do with judicial remuneration, and all of these cases were initiated by judges themselves. And then he goes on to argue that the credibility of the judiciary requires that judges not initiate recourse to law. <clears throat> 
So this is where this kind of criticism goes. Yeah, no, that's my, my reaction again as well. <laughs> Eyebrows raising. I think that this criticism is completely overblown, <laughs> right? There, it, it looks a bit strange, I, I accept, <laughs> when courts are relying on these principles to say, well, you know, don't take away our power or give us more power. But to say that judges shouldn't have recourse to law is, is bizarre, I think. I mean, they're people too, you know? <laughs> so at the, at the most basic level, they're people too. But in many jurisdictions, judges have had to have, rec have recourse to the law because there's no other way to protect the, the jurisdiction or the institution of the court. This has happened in Trinidad and Tobago, where a judge had to make a claim challenging his removal from office. Some of you might remember the recent Korean case. It's happened in the USA, it's happened in Australia, in Canada, of course. So there are situations where judges do have to defend themselves. But I think even beyond that, though, we have to take account of the fact that judges can be sincere in their belief that the court process or the judicial process is important because it actually protects individual rights. So they're not protecting the jurisdiction of the court or the power of the court for its own sake or for their own sake. They're saying that judges or the judiciary, they stand between the individual and the state. They're the last bastion of protection, if you will. And that's essential what's motivating judges in these cases. And they've said so themselves. So I think we have to bear in mind their honest <laughs> protestations that this is what they're actually doing, instead of dismissing it and saying this is just acting out of self-interest. Right, so uh, that's the, the concern about judicial power. And now I'll, this is the last um, kind of point. It's a long point, though. <laughs> the last point I'll make. Uh, which is on the, the concern about not, not internal institutional power, but about external power. Concerns about foreign power and neocolonialism. And this is something I didn't think I'd end up discussing at all um, in my thesis or in the book. But I think it was staring me in the face and it needed discussion. I didn't see it really being addressed in, in the, the existing literature. And I think this arises especially when courts look to implied principles as a connection to the external world, to foreign powers or to universal ideas. So why have judges done this? So Anne-Marie Slaughter has argued that in new democracies, like ours is still considered um, a new democracy, in new democracies, there is a pedagogical appeal of foreign law. And the idea there is that in new democracies, we look to the older democracies to teach us how to be democratic. So they have to kind of teach us how to be constitutional democracies, how to be grown-ups, in a sense. Uh, there's also an argument that there's a psychological comfort in, um, in former colonies, and Val Carnegie has made this argument, um, that in former colonies, we tend to be soothed to some extent by relying on the constitutional framework of the former imperial power. We feel like we're on solid ground in that respect. And I, I think to some extent, this sort of comfort has influenced some elements of our jurisprudence. Though there are some signs, thankfully, that the CCJ is becoming more decidedly Caribbean and less British um, in its jurisprudence, which raises lots of concerns about the fact that so many jurisdictions still retain the Privy Council and have not acceded to the jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. In a broader sense, though, understanding some of the dynamics at play when judges invoke constitutional principles as a link to foreign legal, right, foreign legal uh, precedent or foreign legal thinking means that we also have to reflect on some of the disparities that take place when judges engage in this kind of constitutional uh, discourse across jurisdictions. I'll explain what I mean. When you look at some of the cases, the comparative case law uh, in this area, you see, perhaps not shockingly, that former colonies tend to refer to the former imperial power to a much higher degree than we see the former imperial power referring to the former colonies. In fact, some of the judges um, in the UK House of Lords, they'll continue, they'll talk about, say, principles that came out of Minister of Home, Infa Home Affairs and Fisher, about how to interpret bills of rights, and they'll go on and on and talk about that as if they came up with it, <laughs> and as if this had nothing to do with Caribbean jurisprudence whatsoever. And this, it irks me, for one thing, uh, 
But I think this sort of pattern is important to bear in mind because there's a narrative that judges are talking to each other across the world and law is migrating, and that's not really what's happening. It's almost like there's still a colonial dynamic where law is being passed on from Europe to the former colonies, and that really is disturbing. And if implied principles are being called upon in this sort of way, if they're being used to make links to the former colonial powers, then how much have we moved on? I think perhaps even more disturbing is that you, if you further dissect the case law, you'll see that courts in, among courts in the Commonwealth, the larger, more developed, majority white states are referred to, referred to much more often than the smaller, less developed, majority black states. So in some of more, my more recent work, I've talked about the hierarchy of comparative law because this is indeed what happens. You're <laughs> just, just a lone voice screaming, seriously, black and brown countries have something to say about the law too, you know, listen to us. And there might be a lot of reasons, complex reasons, for this kind of disparity or hierarchy. But I think there definitely is a sense that jurisdictions in more developed countries and jurisdictions in Europe have more reputational currency than us smaller black or brown states. And I think that that has serious implications for, for legal scholarship and legal reasoning, certainly. So if we think that it's important or useful for judges to talk to each other across states, the point is that it's useful because they're talking to each other, that there's a cross current in a sense. If there's an imbalanced migration of legal norms, then that undermines the benefits of this kind of judicial um, talking. It's not a conversation or a dialogue then. And that means that some voices or some perspectives are missing from the, from the debate or from the conversation or from judgment. And that impoverishes jurisprudence, not just in a particular state, but in all the states that tend to refer to each other. <laughs> right? We're missing some critical perspectives here. And I think that is very troubling to me as a comparative constitutional lawyer, certainly. There are also cultural implications to this, this imbalance of borrowing power. Like I said, it reinforces uh, a narrative a narrative that's steeped in a colonial uh, legacy, which suggests that newly independent states that we're still grasping for legitimacy, that we're still trying to prove that we deserve to be on the, on the big stage, we're still trying to prove that we are democratic, we're constitutional. And it suggests that the legitimacy of our law and our institutions relies on the proximity of our law and institutions to, to the laws and institutions of Europe. And that's something that we really have to, uh, to grapple with. All oh, right, that was a, the, the point. That's my, that's my diagram. So you've got one picture, one diagram, <laughs> or something. I don't know if it counts as a diagram. Uh, right, that's the, the, the implications of imbalanced migration. So I'll just wrap up by saying um, what this all amounts to. So after all of that belly aching about um, implied constitutional principles, I don't mean to suggest that we shouldn't be using implied constitutional principles or that we shouldn't be using foreign law. I think conceptually, constitutional principles are part of a general model of constitutionalism. You can't escape them. And as a matter of fact, empirically, these principles are often developed from experiences and laws in other countries or experiences and laws on the international stage. And this fact is sometimes reflected in the preambles in constitutions and bills of rights, for instance. So we can't escape it. Indeed, common law states, the states examined in this book, they all lay claim to observance of and a constitutional commitment to the rule of law and separation of powers. So despite that, the precise application of these principles may differ um, according to local circumstances or local interpretations, the observance and recognition of these principles, they're not exclusive to any one state. And in fact, they're foundational to the very the very structure of democratic constitutionalism. And so we cannot and we should not pursue a project of democratic constitutionalism in an insular manner or in an overly constrained manner. So using implied constitutional principles, that can add value to our constitutional enterprise, even when it raises concerns about judicial power, about fidelity or loyalty to the text of the constitution and about foreign power. But what is crucial is that when we use these principles, we should be aware of these concerns and make a continuing attempt to pursue all the objectives of, of, of our constitutional settlement in balance. And that's all I have to say today. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sishona. Um, I know we'll have lots of comments and thoughts, but I want to give the floor to Tanisha Mary to offer some of her comments. Um, most of you know Tanisha. Uh, Tanisha is a lecturer in the Faculty of Law, um, also an excellent graduate of the Faculty of Law. Uh, Tanisha has built a strong reputation throughout the Caribbean for her work on gender equality, on sexual and reproductive rights, um, right now in the middle of very important policy work on HIV, human rights um, in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Tanisha teaches in public law, teaches the foundational course in law and legal systems, in administrative law. Uh, many don't know Tanisha as a constitutional law scholar, but a lot of her work is within the realm of constitutional law and very much welcome her intervention today, Tanisha. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It is, it is truly um, frightening to be speaking after Tracy and um, Sashano, uh, but I will do my very best. Uh, thank you for joining us, um, for sharing your time with us as we celebrate the work of Dr. Sashana Wheatle. Our principled reasoning in human rights adjudication offers to us an opportunity to think about our constitutions, to think about the ways in which the courts use implied principles in interpreting the text of our constitutions, and in particular, in treating with human rights cases. Uh, Dr. Wheatle's study, as she described, focuses on the implied principles of separation of powers and the rule of law. It examines the function played by these principles in rights adjudication in Australia, Canada, and the Commonwealth Caribbean and the UK. Rather than exclusively focusing on the legitimacy of the use of implied principles, Dr. Wheatle offers a detailed account of why judges appeal to implied principles and the function played by these principles. She reveals that these principles are often used as interpretative aids, gateways to comparative, con comparative judicial analysis, and as grounds for invalidating legislation. What I'm in the process of reading the um, text and what I particularly appreciate about Dr. Wheatle's study is the comprehensive treatment of cases emanating from the Commonwealth Caribbean. Um, she shares in the text that the book adds to the current literature by including detailed contextual analysis of case law from the Commonwealth Caribbean. Um, in the text, she unapologetically points out that the Commonwealth Caribbean is a jurisdiction that is largely ignored in the existing literature and she makes the case that inclusion of Caribbean case law in the discourse on implied constitutional principles brings the post-colonial elements of the law in newly independent states into sharp relief. Through her work, we are able to examine case law within a post-colonial context, taking account of historical factors and the tensions between nationalistic inclinations and foreign influences in constitution building. Uh, this text is of value to issues with which we are concerned in the region. I have found it to be of value to my own research as it explores the issue of equality as an application of the rule of law. In the text, Dr. Wheatle notes the divergent responses to this notion of equality as an application of the rule of law, pointing out that some commentators see the rule of law requirement of equality as being restricted to equal application of laws, while there are others, as well as the courts, which see the rule of law as mandating that laws be equal in substance, that recognize, as was done in a case coming out of the UK, that a discriminatory law undermines the rule of law because it is the antithesis of fairness. And so we focus a bit on laws. But what obtains when it is an amendment to the Constitution that is discriminatory 
either on its face or in its application. And this concern arises especially in light of the 2011 amendments to Jamaica's constitution. And this was something referenced earlier by Dr. Wheatley and also by uh, Tracy Robinson. So in 2011, for those amendments, we had, may I say, modified savings law clause being introduced. Um, and the effect of these clauses is that certain laws are immune from being declared unconstitutional by the courts, even where they contravene fundamental human rights. And these are rights which are guaranteed in the Charter. Way back in 2007, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights would have noted that clauses like this effectively deny citizens and victims in particular the right to seek judicial protection against violation of their fundamental human rights. And so we know that these modified savings law clauses and the laws which they protect sustain and perpetuate inequality and discrimination against certain groups. And so for women, for example, um, the application of these clauses to laws governing sexual violence, laws relating to the life of the, the unborn, is, in my view, indicative of how a seemingly neutral law or amendment can sustain and perpetuate existing gender inequalities and discrimination against women. There are indeed gender-based consequences in the application of these clauses and disparate impacts on women. And so, in reading Dr. Wheatle's text, I am also concerned with what opportunity, if any, is there in the use of implied principles to invalidate constitutional amendments. And I'm speaking of situations where um, there are no substantive limits, uh, which are expressly stated in the Constitution, where the constitutional amendments comply with the procedures laid down in the Constitution. So is there any opportunity at all for the court's use of implied principles to invalidate constitutional amendments where such amendments appear contrary to the rule of law, where the amendments are discriminatory in their effect, where the amendment is contrary to what we may call democratic values that we have come to hold there, or where the amendment is directed to what scholars such as Rosalind Dixon and David Londo call abusive constitutional aims. And these are not new questions. Uh, these are questions that some of our constitutional law scholars in the Caribbean have also been grappling with. Uh, the late Simeon McIntosh, who was previously dean of the Faculty of Law at the UEKville campus, he was of the view that irrespective of the formal limits of the amendment process, the procedures of the Constitution cannot be used to transform the very foundational terms of the constitutional world. And so, in referencing a doctrine known as the Basic Structure Doctrine, which originated in India and has taken somewhat of a hold in Latin America, and this is a doctrine that holds that there are implied substantive limits on the power of the legislature, such that they cannot amend the Constitution to destroy the very structure or to destroy certain fundamental features of the Constitution. And this would include, for example, the denial or non-recognition of fundamental rights and freedoms. In treating with this issue, Dr. Wheatle, uh, the text by Dr. Wheatle, offers insight into some of the conceptual difficulties which arise should the courts attempt to use implied principles to invalidate constitutional amendments. One of the arguments made is that in considering reliance on this doctrine as a consequence of the use of implied constitutional principles, there must be recognition of the fact that the doctrine has been rejected by some jurisdictions that rely on implied constitutional principles. Her conclusion is that the current analysis in the case law does not offer sufficient support for a conclusion that reasoning by implied principle leads to judicial support for doctrines that would permit judicial defeat of constitutional amendments. And this doctrine and the issue of constitutional amendments is also something that has been dealt with by our very own Tracy Robinson, um, Arif Bulkan, and by Justice Adrian Saunders of the CCJ in their text, Fundamentals of Caribbean Constitutional Law. Um, so despite highlighting the, difficult with the difficulties with the justification of this doctrine, um, they have actually acknowledged that we should not rule out the idea 
that certain indefensible constitutional amendments could be challenged on the ground that they amount to a pernicious violation of unwritten constitutional norms. Um, they maintain, however, that this must be an exceptional jurisdiction with narrowly drawn parameters. And so, um, it is clear that there is scope for thinking about what these parameters should be, and also for thinking about how to overcome the conceptual challenges identified by Dr. Riesel in using implied principles to defeat constitutional amendments. And in addressing these issues, we also have to contend with the question of who decides. Dr. Weasel joins a list of established Caribbean scholars, and I'm proud to say graduates of the UA and the Faculty of Law who have contributed to scholarship on issues of grave importance to our region. She has offered a text which is sure to cross boundaries and offer new insights on the way we think about the Constitution, the way we think about what it is, how and where it is located, and who can legitimately conduct this search. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanisha. Um, I'm going to open the floor for some comments. Uh, I know there may be questions. Um, there may be challenges uh, to pose. Uh, or comments which you may have for uh, Sashona Wheatle or Tanisha Myers comments after. Mm -hmm. Okay. You coming, Jeffrey? <laughs> so, Jeffrey Foreman, tutor in constitutional law, and then Gabrielle Elliott Williams, lecturer. All right. Um... So uh, this is to Dr. Rito. Um I also sort of picked up this tendency by the, the courts in using implied principles when it concerns um, matters that are um, close to them. All right, so you mentioned the cases involving judicial salaries, um, but there are also cases involving um, uh, bail, which where instances where uh, the legislature tries to limit the ability of the court to, to grant bail to defendants. Um, and the, the sentencing cases, again, examples where the judicial power is being limited um, in, 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 in some way. Um, so I, I, I suppose that's a, that's a comment uh, agreeing with you um, that these implied principles seem to be easier to, to invoke and to justify by the courts uh, when it touches and concerns their, their remit. And uh, I, I suppose a, a question that I'll, I'll bring up which uh, is, is connected to that is, um, are there examples, um, I suppose some of them may come under the, the basic structure doctrine type of scenarios where you have a, where there's use of implied constitutional principles to uh, in, in, in validate or to uphold um, straightforward human rights um, uh, um, uh, uh, situation. So um, something that is not, um, I suppose, be something that's human rights in the extent that it affects the liberty, liberty of the person and sentencing is human rights in the sense of um, um, cruel and inhuman and, um, treatment. Uh, but but out, outside of those things that, um, again, I'm trying to distinguish as being matters that affect the judicial power directly, um, are there examples of these principles being used in other um, human rights type cases? Um, so I'm going to take a few and then hand back to the table. Um, so Gabrielle Elliott Williams. who also has a history and a life in constitutional law unknown to most people. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Wheatle. Thank you, um, Ms. Mary. So um, as, as I'm particularly interested, um, Dr. Wheatle, in 
the, the last point that, that you discussed, mm -hmm. um, where you're, you're considering um, what looks like neocolonialism. Mm -hmm. So if, if we say that we're aiming at uh, Caribs prudence, but we reflexively return to the fountain head of justice, how, how do we achieve that? And how do we figure out what that Caribs prudence will look like? So how, how do we strike the balance between um, figuring out what universal values are um, and, and aiming at them versus um, figuring out what's culturally best for us, what's culturally relevant. I hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. And then maybe to, to wrap up this round, um, I wanted to ask a few questions. Uh, <laughs> So my first is, what is the constitutional settlement you're presuming? <laughs> uh, you made reference a number of times to uh, trying to work through, be consistent with, be sincere to some constitutional settlement. And um, you know, most of us in the Caribbean can't find it. You know, in fact, we feel as if the constitution actually derives its le legitimacy afterwards and through its working out rather than through some inception moment. And so how important is that in, in your thinking through of implied principles? And then on the question of contradictory effects, that we imply principles even when it's contradictory. Uh, some of us would say, or put it slightly differently, if you borrow from Simeon McIntosh, he would say the Constitution is contradictory. Uh, that it's not so clear what it means because it said so in the Savings Law Clause, but it's saying something else over there. And so what the implied principle does is to help us to work through that. So rather than say it's, you know, the implied principle in Mollison is contradictory with section, the old 26.8, which says you shouldn't be looking closely at these particular laws, he would say, well, you know, look at section two, look around it, and you're going to hear very different ideas. Um, and so if the constitutions are contradictory, can't we find more legitimacy for this as a way through, rather than assuming there's some constitutional settlement which was coherent, um, why aren't we allowed to acknowledge <laughs> uh, the incoherence of the instruments which uh, in many cases we inherited um, or sort of developed? Uh, so in other words, it's less cynical than the idea that is contradictory. And then the question suggested by Gabby, I would put differently, is what's Caribbean jurisprudence? Um, I don't know for sure. You know, I don't know what makes it Caribbean versus something else. Um, it's not coconut milk or some particular seasoning. Um, how do we decide that a particular way of thinking about law is distinctly Caribbean? And how do we understand Caribbean in a place which is also and continues to be deeply hierarchical. So often we assert that some people are Caribbean and some things are un-Caribbean. Uh, isn't there a risk in that kind of analysis, given that Caribbean has not been available and open to all? Um, and then finally, a question about outsider interpretation and neocolonialism. Just to ask you, your thoughts on the role of outsider interpretation. This is the terminology of Dixon and, and Jackson. Um, in thinking about the impact of outside <laughs> and the continuing role of outside, could we also think about how many people just walk in and represent particular issues in Caribbean courts as foreign lawyers? Uh, something we couldn't contemplate doing. Uh, you know, to think concretely, not just that there's a court in London that hears the majority of um, the last resort cases, but also in Trinidad, in Belize, there are jurisdictions in which foreign lawyers practice, including the Caribbean Court of Justice. Uh, what impact is that having on the thinking about implied principles, including um, what I think you will see emerging as, in, in, as growing interest in equality? So the floor is yours, <laughs> and also to Tanisha if she has comments. <laughs> 
Right, okay, so I'll, I might have to ask people to just clarify. Um, if I can, I'm thinking of you, Tracy. Um, sorry. <laughs> I might have to ask for clarifications on some of these questions or to remind me, but I, especially I think probably on the last point you made. But I'll start with um, Jeffrey's question. I'll start with Jeffrey's question, um, which I think was, are there examples of principles used in cases that do not concern judicial power, so just kind of bare or straight human rights issues? And yes, there are examples of that, but not as an independent ground on which the courts will then stride down legislation. So the, the courts tend to use principles um, to defend human rights when the, the principles are being used as interpretative aids. Uh, so f this is where, for instance, the equality discussion came up in the book. It was about all those cases where the rule of law is being seen as containing um, a right to equality in some sense, and then that's used to help interpret a particular provision. So this has been used in gay rights cases, for instance, in the UK. Um, I have not seen any instance where uh, a principle has been used to strike down legislation that has not concerned um, judicial power. But I think there might be sensible reasons for that. One of the reasons I think is that um, the courts will only use that step or use what might be considered exceptional um, constitutional methods if they think that, the, like I said, the last bastion of protection for the individual might be threatened. So on, the thinking is that if a human right is under, is under threat, there are different ways and means of going about protecting that human right. Usually, it's the court that's the last um, uh, port of call for protecting that human right. If the jurisdiction of the court itself is threatened and there's nothing in the Constitution that, that solves this problem, then the court has to rely on an implied constitutional principle in that case because there's nothing else it can do. So that's kind of my thinking on why, why it happens that way. I also think, and I argue this in the book, that Courts will tend to rely on implied principles in a stronger way when the principle has to do with um, kind of structural or institutional questions. Why? Because you can present a structural issue of, as, as one of just figuring out who should be deciding what instead of figuring out who should get what rights. And for some reason, that's less controversial in some sense, because I think partly as lawyers, we feel more comfortable on safer ground when we're just dealing with, dealing with something that seems a bit more technical, that doesn't seem to be moral, doesn't seem to be very political. So we're not going to use the principle to decide, to, to decide or to base a, dis, a decision on, um, on an issue concerning gender or, um, or substantive, any substantive right issue, because that's a more of a moral question, it's more of a political question, it's more susceptible to lots of arguments and debates and interpretation. And so it's a bit more, the courts would be a bit more uncomfortable in that kind of case. Whereas I think they made the argument that if it's a separation of powers ground or something that has to do with what power belongs in which institution, then it's fine because they're not saying that the courts will decide the issue in any particular way. They're not saying, for instance, that the court will decide that um, uh, abortions can be allowed. They're just saying that it's the court that has the authority to make that decision, which seems to be a bit, perhaps a bit less controversial in this country, at least in this jurisdiction. I think in, in the US you're talking about something completely different. But that, that's the point. I think a structural ground seems to be easier in some respect for, for, for courts. And I see this in, in all the jurisdictions I've studied in, in, in the common law, and I found that quite interesting. I don't think they're necessarily right that structural issues don't involve all these like, fungible um, interpretations, but it does seem a bit easier to rely on structural grounds um, when it deals with it, on structural grounds um, rather than relying on something that's a bit more substantive. Hope that helps answer your question. Uh, all right, the second question: How do we figure out what is it? Jurisprudence is that is that the term? Um, mm -hmm. What that will look like. I think it's an ongoing project, and this is perhaps also a response to your, Tracy's question about um, what is the constitutional settlement. This is ongoing. It's about process. It's not necessarily that there's a big bang and, you know, at the point of inception of the Constitution, everything was worked out. So I think it's ongoing. Um, and I think this idea of developing jurisprudence or Caribbean jurisprudence is also ongoing. But in my work since the, since the book, I've talked about um, Caribbean jurisprudence. If we we're to develop our own idea, our own identity of, 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 of our constitution and our constitutionalism, 
that would have to mean that we've, we have to engage more with history and colonial history to an extent that the Privy Council, for instance, just won't or, or can't. And the Caribbean Court of Justice has been making some steps in this direction. So for instance, in um, the Meyer Leaders Alliance case that had to do with indigenous rights, um, I thought that decision was absolutely groundbreaking because they talked about um, the implications or the impact of colonialism, the impact on, of, on land rights for indigenous peoples. And they challenged some of these ideas that lands would have been um, considered unoccupied before the, the, the mighty Europeans came. You know, They challenged the erasure of indigenous peoples and indigenous structures before Europeans came. And I thought that was, abs that was so exciting. These are the things I get excited about. But I thought that was so exciting that they did that. And they, they had this kind of reason, even while using implied principles, which answered one of the questions I had as I was writing the book. Can you use these sorts of principles while carving out a constitutional space. And I questioned whether that could be done, but I think the CCJ shows us how to do it. You have to seriously grapple with history. You have to take the different peoples of the region seriously. And I think that's what they've shown that they can do. And that's, that takes me to kind of the, the last point about how you develop a Caribbean jurisprudence. You realize that the Caribbean is a mixture. That's, that's part and parcel of what we are about. So Stuart Hall um, has, I realize Stuart Hall is, is, is very famous beyond what I even considered him to be in, in kind of anthropology studies and social sciences and political sciences because he talked about the impact or the, the, the nature of creolization and what that means in the Caribbean and what it can mean for other countries. And this idea of creolization is the idea that we're mixing, it's a mix of cultures, um, a mix of different systems of law, a mix of peoples, and that that is part of Caribbean identity. And he has this thing where he said, you know, we are all Caribbeans now in our urban archipelagos or something like that, which apparently was a big deal to lots of people in anthropology studies. And I just thought, I didn't know anything about this. I was just studying my doctrinal legal um, stuff, going through cases. I didn't know all of this was happening. And I think that kind of thinking has implications for how we think about Caribbean jurisprudence by recognizing that it's about mixture. It's about a process of developing an identity. And I think the, the CCJ is grappling with that, and we see some hints of that in its jurisprudence. I either wish the Privy Council could do that, or that we would just all realize that we need to kind of move on to the CCJ and be comfortable <laughs> with having our decisions, our highest decisions being made by us. Right? I, I might have strayed there from the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anisha, any, any comments? No? Or <laughs> and any other comments? Any other? Yes? Dr. Celia Blake. Um, thank you very, very much for your very, very nice Can you use the mic, Celia, just for the streaming? Yes. <laughs> thank you very much, both of you, um, Dr. Blake, for your very insightful lecture, and, and um, Tanisha for your, for your comments thereafter. And there's something that I'd just like to ask both of you to comment on that. Don't you think it's just a little. Um, pernicious maybe, um, in terms of using implied principles of interpretation to uh, protect judicial authority or judicial jurisdiction in terms of decision-making power. And I'm talking about the CCJ case, IJCHR and Syringa Marshall. Uh, but before you answer, know that you have the mic, Dr. Blake. I mean, you've been making an argument about language rights. I wanted to raise that, but I just thought maybe people want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> because it feels like there is an area where both you can test um, Sashana's idea of a Caribbean jurisprudence. I was uh, actually going to ask her, ask whether or not, um, if you think that the whole language of the text, all right, and the language in which the text is, has something to do with what Gabby calls jurisprudence. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. The language of the text, sorry, I might ask you to explain, what, what, what do you mean exactly? Well, I, 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 I'm pleased to tell you that I, I have a big interest in, in language rights and Creole language rights okay. um, and the question of, um, you know, legal language and the accessibility of it, yeah, um, to, to the peoples of the Caribbean, okay. being what, both legal language as well as English being the foundation of that legal and also pushed for the inclusion of the protection of language rights in the 2011 charter unsuccessfully. <laughs> uh, 
Sorry, I just I kind of wanted to just have a conversation with you. Now I'm realizing that you asked me a question. I'm trying to think what the question actually was. So oh, that yes. Asked me about, because you spoke about um, you know, the kind of conflict. Right. In relation to just the uh, Right. Uh, yes. In relation to, for example, salaries or Yes. Right. Is it on principle if I say I agree with you on, about that particular case, the IGCHR case? But I think otherwise it's fine. But that one was really, really troubling. Um, that might seem a bit on principle, but I swear, deep, deep down, there's a, there's a very principled justification for my difference of opinions there. But I think it, it might present as being pernicious. But I, I think if you dig down in the judgments, the explanations given by the judges kind of make sense. Because like I said, this is, they, they kind of call, call upon using principles in this way to strike down legislation. It seems to me it's as a last resort. So they don't want to do this and they only call upon it, I think, when it is the only way to ensure that they can still continue protecting rights. So there was a case in the UK that I, my, my students in the UK know is, is one of my favorite cases, Jackson and the Attorney General, where, where the judges said some really um, blasphemous things, really, about the power of the courts to strike down legislation, because they said in exceptional circumstances, and this is in the UK, no written constitution, parliamentary supremacy is the order of the day, and yet they said in exceptional circumstances, the courts might consider that they need to modify the meaning of parliamentary supremacy, and that if there's legislation that subverts, um, that seeks to subvert judicial review, that they might need to, 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 to uh, what was the word? To make it clear, to make it clear to, to parliament that this is a step that parliament cannot take, which is absolute heresy at the time. And a lot of UK academics tried to play it down by saying, well, they were just, you know, they were just venting. They would never do that. It was obiter dicta, which is fine. It was obiter dicta, fine. But the judges have said it again. <laughs> it's come up again. Um, the point is, what was happening around that case was that Parliament was debating a piece of legislation called the Asylum and Immigration uh, Bill. And what that bill sought to do was prevent judicial review of asylum and immigration decisions. Right, so you're talking about potentially some of the most vulnerable people um, that can exist in a state. People who are not citizens and asylum seekers especially who have no other means of recourse really. And, the, and government and parliament was trying to, trying to essentially ensure that any decision made by immigration decision makers or asylum decision makers could not be challenged in courts. And this is when the judges decided to say, you cannot do this, you cannot remove the power of judicial review, you cannot remove the power of the courts to stand between the individual and the state. And I use that as an example to show that I don't think the courts are just motivated by naked self-interest here. I think that they're doing this in aid of something else. So they're saying, we can protect individual rights, we have lots of tools in our arsenal to do that, but if you prevent us from using those tools, then individuals suffer, the citizens suffer, Asylum seekers who aren't even considered, who aren't citizens, they suffer. And I think that's a, that's a good example of seeing that it's, it, it might seem that courts are just being self-interested or they're just acting out of institutional self-interest, but I think it's probably a bit more complicated than that. Fine, there, there might be a bit of institu institutional self-interest there. Because <laughs> I think it's natural that it would happen, that you want to protect the institution that you're a part of. I think that's natural. But I think that we can't forget the other side of it as well, which is that they think that their power is in aid of something useful. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you on the, the whole language issue. The Constitution definitely should be more accessible. It should be. And there have been projects by um, academics and activists um, the Feminist Judgments Legal Project that uh, some of you might have heard about. There's also a child rights um, legal project. And I think the child, like, child rights one is fascinating because it speaks to this issue of language. What, these pe what people have been doing is that they've been rewriting judgments in family law cases in language that children would be able to understand because a lot of these cases have to do with children. Mm -hmm. And in family law, the interests of a child um, that's paramount. And yet, children can't read these cases. They don't understand what any of this is about. So there's a thinking that we should write, legis or write cases rather in a way that can speak to the persons affected by these cases. And I don't see why we couldn't do that for constitutions, 
as well. So I think there's definitely something, there's something to that. Mm -hmm. there's, yeah, there's so much there about language and how language plays a role and what it means when, when judges speak about rule of law, for instance. So I think in some of the earlier cases in the Caribbean, they use this kind of, it's, they use this kind of language not just as a constitutional technique, but it's rhetorical and it's sending a signal in a rule of law. This is British, see? We're, we're, we're just like the British, you know, we're good. Honestly, we're good. We're doing this the right way. And I think there's a lot of that going on in some of the, the, the early cases as well. Mm -hmm. I'd love to talk to you more about, um, about mm -hmm. this. Well, thank everyone for coming. Um, students, colleagues, friends, um, attorneys in practice, it's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, let me end by thanking uh, Professor Seshona Wheatle uh, for spending a few weeks with us in the faculty and particularly for sharing with us uh, some of the really important um, insights and analysis from her book. I'm also deeply grateful to Tanisha Mary, uh, who picked up some of the important themes. Uh, constitutional law students, very familiar with the discussion about the basic structure doctrine um, and some of the concerns about the 2011 Charter of Rights. Um, both very valuable discussions to have along with your questions and interventions. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Refreshments should be outside on the right-hand side. Please join us.